Great. Uh, well, it looks like we still have a few more people joining us, but we have a lot to cover. So let's get started. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today for the webinar. Uh, my name is Adam Prescott. I'm an attorney at Bernstein Schur in Portland, Maine. Um, and today is our last in a series of five webinars um, celebrating Cooperative Month for strengthening the cooperative economy. Um, when we were planning the sessions for the webinar um, and thinking of different ideas, talking about um, housing co-ops was something that repeatedly came up in those conversations as something that was a you know, interesting topic um, and very important to, to cover. Um, and so really excited to have this session today um, and our group of experts on the panel. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna cover housing co-ops now and in the future. Um, joining me today are our three panelists. We have Joe Cicerelli, the director from Cooperative Development Institute, um, Nora Gosselin, market development specialist, also at CDI, and Craig Saddlemeyer, the cooperative development organizer at Raise Up. Um, we have a, a lot to cover today, um, and we're going to work through so starting with some introductions and background to housing co-ops and the, ty the types of housing co-ops. Um, and then we're gonna turn into some more specific areas that Joe, Craig and Nora are gonna cover for us. So um, let me get out of the way and turn it over to the experts. So why don't we start um, with you, Craig, on our slide regarding you know, equity options. Can you walk us through the three different types of housing cooperatives just to lay the framework for what we're gonna discuss today? I am sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Kelly, a Spanish interpreter. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, explain how to use interpretation before we start. Is that okay? Should I explain it now? Yes. Uh, sorry, Kelly. Please go right ahead. That's fine. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly. I will be an uh, English or Spanish interpreter. We are going to have simultaneous interpretation. Um, on the bottom of your computer, you're going to find a globe. You click on the globe, and from there, you will be able to select the language that you want to hear um, the webinar. Buenos días, mi nombre es Kelly. Uh, um, soy la intérprete de inglés y español. Vamos a tener sí, interpretación simultánea el día de hoy. Y eh, en la pantalla, cuando se active la interpretación, van a ver un globo. Ahí van a poder seleccionar español. Muchas gracias. OK, interpretation can be enabled now. Thank you. Great. Th thanks a lot, Kelly. Um, so let me, let me turn it back over to uh, you, Craig, to walk us through the different types of housing co-ops. Great, thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. I'm Craig Salmeyer, Cooperative Development Organizer for the Raise Up Housing Cooperative. Um, so to begin, I thought it would be useful just to be aware that you know, the, the housing cooperative model is, is pretty uh, adaptive. It can be used in a number of different configurations and to serve a number of different uh, income levels and um, can also be used to uh, earn more or less equity for the for the residents, depending on how it's set up. So the, the three basic types of housing cooperatives to choose from uh, when one is creating their housing cooperative is a market rate, a limited equity or group equity. The primary differences is that in a market rate, uh, the share of stock that the residents have in their housing cooperative can be sold at whatever uh, the market will pay for that share of stock or those shares of stock in, uh, in the cooperative. Um, and uh, typically there are also uh, little to no limits on how much um, they could potentially earn an interest or dividends on their investment uh, in their housing cooperative as well, um, though there may be, um, but in, in general, it's more it's more based on what the market uh, allows. In a limited equity, there's um, st still some kind of return on investment that's available there for the residents, uh, but it's gonna be limited and limited with the intention of um, avoiding windfall profits, uh, you know, when uh, there might be a huge housing market boom um, and in a market rate, someone could really um, cash in or cash out uh, in those circumstances, limited equity, is trying to moderate that effect to keep the housing uh, relatively affordable to the next uh, homeowner, to the next buyer, um, while also allowing for some return on investment to the residents. And then lastly, group equity 
is sort of the, the, the full nonprofit version of a housing cooperative where um, any equity that's being developed through the project, um, you know, as the property value, as the, the desire of the, uh, you know, demand in the community to live in this particular housing cooperative grows, um, that equity is retained by the corporation. It's not extracted by any of the individual residents in the form of dividends, interest, or profit. Um, and that, that group equity is still valuable, can still be leveraged, um, you know, can be borrowed against, for example, uh, for the benefit of the group, um, but they're not going to be making any kind of profit. The financial benefit to the residents of living in a group equity housing cooperative is going to be savings. It's going to be, um, you know, quality housing, but operating uh, with in the interest of keeping the, the operating costs down. Um, and it's not going to be those other, uh, you know, returns on investment. Uh, that they're going to be able to get. So those are the three different types of housing co-ops. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to CDI to talk about the work that they do in this realm. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Adam. Really happy to be here with Bernstein Schur and on this webinar uh, with Craig, who brings so much uh, insight and expertise to this uh, work. So the Cooperative Development Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1994 by co-op leaders in the Northeast region. Uh, you can see our mission there. Uh, our early work was around business ownership solutions, cooperative food systems. And then in 2009, we began uh, the New England resident-owned communities uh, work in the manufactured housing sector. And this is a limited equity program, as Craig just described everything. And next slide, please, Rebecca. I think it's useful to inject some history at this point. Uh, Resident-owned communities at scale in the manufactured housing sector uh, began in New Hampshire in 1982, when a mobile home park in Meredith, New Hampshire, was being closed for redevelopment. Uh, was going to displace all the residents who lived there. Uh, at the time, there was uh, the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund was newly launched, uh, led by the amazing Julie Eads, and they met with the residents. And after considering many options, uh, decided to make an offer to the owner to purchase, to, to have the residents purchase the park. And uh, the owner accepted. And when Julie tells this story, she shares that the Sisters of Mercy provided a large loan to support this resident purchase. And when they were handing the check over, uh, Julie went to take it and the sisters didn't let it go. And Julie looked up and they looked at her and said, uh, you better pay us back. And it's a humorous story, but it also gets to the heart of how this model that the loan fund then created to replicate that resident purchase went to great lengths to protect capital investment for re resident purchase. Julie wisely knew at the mo in the moment that if a, if a failure occurred, uh, it would scare capital away. And so the program that she and her staff designed uh, included really intensive technical assistance to guide the residents through the purchase and then the ongoing operations of their community as, a, as an ongoing business for, for years to come. And that model and culture exists today because one of Julie's great early hires in, in that program was a fellow by the name of Paul Bradley. And Paul took this uh, program nationally uh, in 2008 with Rock USA and created a program where we now have 10 affiliates uh, working through the ROC program uh, to uh, help 303 resident-owned communities across the U.S. So since 1982, 303 ROCs uh, exist, and not a single one has failed, and not a single one has returned to the uh, uh, to an investor-owned. Pretty a pretty amazing track record. Next slide, please, Rebecca. And then the Cooperative Development Institute, uh, of course, we started this program in 2009. And since then, we have helped residents purchase 58 communities throughout New England. 
And that doesn't include New Hampshire's now 143 resident owned communities. So two thirds of the of the total number of rocks across the country are right here in New England. It's you know a, you know permanently preserving 5,547 affordable homes in in the area, and you can see the total development costs. And then here in Maine, uh, we have 10 resident-owned communities, and uh, since 2012, and this is growing a little slower because there isn't an opportunity to purchase statute in Maine. And uh, it actually only exists in six states across the country. Uh, but that, in a state where there is legislation that protects the residents' rights at purchase, uh, those states have more uh, activity around resident purchase. And in Maine, we're protecting 500 homes with $9 million in uh, total development costs. And that is an introduction to CDI, Adam. Nora, did I miss anything? Anything you'd like to cover? You got it. I'm sure it'll come up in the questions later on. All right. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And I think this is sort of coming to what I think you're going to discuss next. But um, yeah, I'm sure um, everyone on here is familiar with the increase in, in housing costs um, in recent time, and I'll open this up to, to everyone on. Um, but can you maybe talk a little bit about you know, how housing cooperatives play a role in providing affordable housing? And then related to that, just a question that came in, um, another issue um, here in Maine, certainly for workforce housing co-ops and how you've seen those implemented to provide housing for um, employees as a benefit to them. So maybe I'll, I'll just get us tackling the first question. Um, in terms of the affordability that comes from uh, the sector that we're working in, manufactured housing co-ops, a really a big part of it, and I know it extends to all types of housing co-ops, uh, multifamily as well, is that you're not profiting off of the housing. Um, the profits are, you know, quality services, money staying in the common infrastructure, uh, you know, the social benefits of it, the, you don't need to worry about the turnover, but you're not having a landlord sort of then, you know, take another additional chunk on top of that. So we see, you know, this graphic here that over time you get, you know, rents that really stabilize. Um, you know, every couple years, Rock USA looks at all of the borrowers across all of, you know, everyone that's all the resident owned communities that are part of their network and sort of says, okay, what does it look like after five years with rents? What does it look like after 10 years? And they see after five years in this, in the information that just came out, you know, that site fees are about 11% below market rate. And after 10 years, they're 21% below market rate. And so while communities around our resident owned communities are, you know, turning over hands or just costs are going up and then, you know, a uh, community owner also understandably is going to profit as well. Uh, you know, in a resident owned community, you have the stabilization effect. Uh, you vote on your budget, you vote where you want your money to go. Um, so we see that that's how we ensure, we work with groups to ensure affordability. Um, in terms of the uh, workforce housing, I know this is really making me think about our colleagues over in the in the business side of CDI, because I know that they're working a lot with groups that are setting up cooperative businesses with housing component, the understanding being that housing and work, you know, and employment are not distinct things. They need one to do the other. Um, but I think that, I don't know, I think we'd want to consult with them about what they're seeing. Um, what do you think, Joe? Anything I'm missing there or Craig? Right, I, I, I do think it's, a, it, it's an issue. And I think one of the ways that, uh, you know, the rock model deals with this is that, you know, for example, in Maine, we have, we have rock communities in Freeport and in Camden and in Rockland. And the folks that live in those communities work in those communities. And if they didn't have these communities to live in, their, their housing costs, they couldn't afford the median price of a home in those communities. And they would have to move further away and it would make it just more difficult uh, for them uh, you know, to get to work or they have to spend more time getting to work. So these communities, when we can secure them with resident ownership and provide long-term land leases and uh, lower lot rents, uh, we preserve these uh, permanently for them. 
and it does support uh, workforce housing development from that angle. Oh, great, Th thanks, Joe and Nora. Let maybe a good time to bring in Craig, um, give, give him the topic, and let him tell everyone a little bit more about um, his work at RaiseOp. Thanks very much. Um, and I'll, I'll begin by saying that uh, you know we see the a similar uh, effect, maybe even over a shorter period of time, with regards to affordability. Um, when we when we start a new uh, housing cooperative building uh, at first costs are maybe kind of comparable to market rate because that's sort of the point in time at which you know we bought the building and got the financing and are paying those related costs um, but over time as as rent goes up for people in the in privately owned housing um, that uh, is including that you know that profit factor uh, we're just our costs are just rising with inflation um, which when you set when you take out that profit component is a much uh, lower rate of, of increase. So today we have, you know, three three bedroom apartments that we uh, rent to our residents for something something in the range of seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred dollars, um, whereas uh, on the private market someone would be paying at least fourteen fifteen hundred dollars or more uh, for the same size unit. So uh, the Raise Up Housing Cooperative were Maine's oldest urban multi-unit affordable housing cooperative. Um, and we've been around since 2008. We've gone through a, a few iterations. Um, we started as just a, a limited equity housing cooperative, just a three unit apartment building. And we were all uh, member managed. Um, so there was no, no separation between the board of directors and members. And we did not have any kind of professional support. It's just all volunteer run. We have since grown. We've converted to a group equity model so that uh, as op operating as a strictly nonprofit, we're able to get more resources and sub subsidy that's needed to uh, support lower income residents uh, and have a more uh, you know, diverse representative uh, community of residents that, that reflects the neighborhood in which we operate. So today we have uh, 15 apartments, we have 50 residents. And uh, the something that I think is important to emphasize about our model is that we were sort of founded in a tradition of community organizing in Lewiston. So we were responding to some really, uh, really atrocious housing conditions. Um, uh, people may be aware of the fires that took place in 2013. Some of our founding members had lost their homes to those fires, but uh, you know the the Tree Street neighborhood in Lewiston had experienced a lot of uh, divestment, a lot of neglect, a lot of abuse uh, by property owners, and um, we had one one small housing co-op as an example as an example of an alternative to that, where the residents had control and could make their own decisions about uh, you know the cost of their home and the quality of their home. And uh, we've been trying to, to grow that model. And the work that we do is not just about benefiting our residents, but looking at uh, you know, the conditions in the neighborhood as it relates to the quality of life for our residents, uh, but also quality of life for, for our neighbors. And we really try to uh, help our residents get engaged in, uh, in the community in urban planning efforts, in issues that uh, affect them outside of their home and affect their neighborhood. And uh, we've had a lot of success in doing that. Uh, we played a big leadership role in Lewiston getting the Choice Neighborhood Grant, um, and it's which is Lewiston's the smallest community to ever receive uh, this grant. It will be uh, it will leverage basically up to $100 million for new affordable housing and a lot of neighborhood improvements. And uh, that's just what, one of the latest examples of our involvement in the community. But we really see this as not, not just about uh, unit, affordable units for our people, but um, really about community change uh, and using, using the co-op model, using the relationships that we develop through operating our own housing affordably as a vehicle for having a, a bigger, broader, better impact on the community at large. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. 
So as I said, we have uh, three apartment buildings today in operation. Those are 100 year old triple decker buildings that we've done some renovations to. We're currently involved in our first new construction project. So these will be uh, two, two sites totaling 18 new affordable units. These are infill projects. Um, the buildings will be passive house certified, uh, which is a very uh, rigorous energy and air quality standard. And we're doing this through the state's 4% low income housing tax credit program. So this is, this is main, ta tax credits have been used to do, you know, housing cooperatives elsewhere. This is Maine's first go at it. One thing that we've learned in this process is that uh, as far as the tax credit program goes, the federal rules underwriting the, the program require that or allow that a housing co-op could be the uh, developer of a project or the housing co-op could be the tenant of a LIHTC project with a master lease, but it can't be both. So, so there is a way to do, and, and um, for, for anyone who's not aware, you know, the low-income housing tax credit is really the primary way that new affordable housing is being constructed. Uh, at least as far as you know, multi-unit urban housing goes, and um, and it, it the law was definitely not written to accommodate housing cooperatives, and I think we'll get you know more into some of the, the policy and funding issues that are out there. Um, but uh, the point here is there are some workarounds. Co-ops can access the program, but they can't access it as fully as I think most housing cooperatives would want to. Um, so most commonly what happens is a housing cooperative has a master lease for the property in question. Uh, they don't really have much decision-making power over that property for the 15 years that the tax credit program is in operation, uh, but they do have an option to purchase it at the end of those 15 years, at which point they could more fully, you know, manage it as, as a cooperative with more with greater decision making power uh, but up until that 15 year point uh, they're basically tenants uh, complying with the with the terms of the light tech program the last thing i'll say about this project is uh, you know to, to the end of being interested in promoting more you know good quality affordable housing which maine sorely needs uh, the design that we're uh, developing for this project is going to be open source. Um, we haven't decided exactly on, on what terms yet, but uh, we've tried to develop some uh, design something that could be easily developed uh, to code on a standard vacant lot in Lewiston. Uh, you know, basically uh, 100 by 100 feet, or maybe even 50 by 100 feet, depending on the parking requirements and how close you are to uh, municipal parking. So uh, we try to, everything we try to do, we're trying to, add, every project we engage in, we try to ask how can we, you know, multiply the benefits of this for the community, for the affordable housing. Uh, and yeah, I think the next slide is maybe, um, maybe we wanna hold on to this and get into some of the questions um, before we get more into this topic. I think that'd be my suggestion at this point, Adam. Yeah, sure, Craig. Let me. I have a couple follow-up questions for you before we turn it back over to, to Joe and Nora. So, um, just in terms of who who can live in the the housing co-op buildings, do you have to be a member? How does that work with family members? Um, do they also have to be members to live there? Um, can you just give us a little background on that? So, um, and it, generally speaking, with housing cooperatives, um, each household has one member of the household that's the official shareholding member. So they, they buy one or more shares of stock in the co-op, depending on what the uh, you know, minimal investment level is. Um, and they are the person that uh, makes the decisions uh, for their household and for their investment, for their lease. Um, so they, they're the ones that decide whether to sell their share, um, whether to transfer it, whether to terminate their lease uh, and, and how to vote at meetings. Um, and some co-ops allow for proxy voting. Um, 
but uh, it's it's one member, one vote uh, is a pretty consistent principle across across all cooperatives. Um, and in addition to that, there can be uh, some cooperatives. Some cooperatives might requ require that every unit is occupied by a shareholding member, um, but in some cases there can be residents who are just renting. Um, but but usually, and, and the state statute for the most part requires that at least a majority of the units um, or of the spaces in the co-op are occupied by shareholding members. And as much as in our case, the minimum is 80% of our units need to be occupied by shareholding members. But the, that other 20% could be tenants if we opt for that. Uh, great, Th thanks, Craig. And in terms of actually just sort of day-to-day -day operations of the building um are the are the members responsible for sort of maintenance and collecting rent and dealing with that do you have a management company um what is it sort of i guess question is sort of what does it look like just day-to-day -day running the buildings and maybe how different is it or is it not different from a uh, i guess a non-cooperative housing building um so yeah i think the management can really run the whole the whole spectrum typically i think what you're going to find is the, the smaller the housing cooperative, the more the residents are going to be doing stuff themselves, the bigger the housing cooperative, the more professionalized it's going to be. Um, and the more professionalized you probably want it to be. In our case, what we have is we have two in-house staff people that are supporting the professional operation um, and management uh, of the co-op. We have a board of directors that supervises staff, um, but you know the staff are the ones collecting the rent, supporting members with you know helping them understand the rules of the co-op, uh, implementing the policy that the board makes. Uh, but our board of directors is made up primarily of our residents, um, and we have a contract for maintenance services. So residents could get involved in maintenance if they have those skills and interests, but it's it's not a requirement, and in most cases, I find. Maintenance can get it done faster, and cheaper than a lot of do-it-yourself efforts. As as exciting as people as as DIY is, uh, in many cases, you know the, the pros can just really save you a lot of <laughs> a lot of headache, and in the end, a lot of money by not um, you know screwing up a maintenance thing that you try to do yourself. So, um, so we yeah we have twenty four seven on demand maintenance services, and uh, but the as far as the the management of it um and the decision making for the you know making the budgets and all of that our residents are very involved in, in that process yeah no, that, that that sort of makes sense um let me sort of open it back up to joe and nora um you know craig had mentioned you know financing through the low-income housing tax credits um just re received a question about financing can you talk about you know on the cdi side what you see in terms of financing housing co-ops and maybe some of the challenges that you have that um, you know traditional housing developments may not face um so we have a just a uh to what craig was just saying too i was just going to echo that that is very similar to how a resident owned community would work with a property management company um, in terms of we don't want neighbors collecting rent on their neighbors for the most part and uh it, there's so much expertise in terms of uh maintenance in a community but oftentimes we like to say all right let's get some professional preferred vendor lists so it feels ideally pretty like seamless you know with a lot more control than living in a privately owned community in terms of services and a lot more say um, in terms of financing we have a number CDI of like really strong lending partners that has supported the 58 communities that we've helped convert um, rock capital, which is part of the rock USA national version of this uh, movement. Um, provides you know 100% loan to value financing so that residents in communities that are considering converting do not need to come up with you know 10,000 20,000 30,000 dollars out of pocket which we just know is going to make it non feasible non accessible it's just not going to work for people um and then in maine we have genesis and um coastal enterprise i mean cei i always mess up that particular acronym <laughs> um and also the cooperative fund of the northeast so we have partners in this uh and then we have banks that we've worked with um td bank eastern bank 
um, Joe will let me know I'm missing some in that long list that basically allow us when we're working through a conversion through a sale um, to you know get that 100% financing present a package uh, that has been built by residents to the to the whole community and say this is what it's going to look like this is the rate this is the the cost um, of purchasing your community and then additionally this is the cost of mate of um, capital improvements um, so a lot of times we see you know uh, maybe a couple years maybe a couple decades of deferred maintenance uh, in communities that maybe were originally set up as you know non-permanent housing or campgrounds we've seen all types of infrastructure stuff that run a wide range um, so part of the resident ownership model is not letting that snowball it's really saying okay you're going to buy your community but also we want to set you up we want to support you in taking care of stuff that might have like slid under the radar for a couple decades and you got sewer backing up into people's houses or you don't have any lighting and it's no one can see what when they're getting their mail so that's part of the financing that we're talking about here is also making sure that co-ops are set up when they convert with reserves uh, and then they have a 10-year plan to keep you know putting that together so nothing gets deferred um, Um, I don't Joe, do you have anything else to add or any other um, financing sources in your experience? No, I, I think Nora covered it. You know, we, we have a great partnership with Genesis Community Loan Fund, really want to lift that. Uh, they've been fantastic partners with us uh, to convert those uh, 10 rocks in Maine. And, and they attract other uh, banks, you know, Bangor Savings, Camden National Bank. Uh, so we are, we are attracting some capital, some local banks uh, to get into the sector. And, you know, we, and we remain unsubsidized. You know, we are the largest uh, manufactured housing community is the largest source of unsubs unsubsidized affordable housing in the country. And, um, you know, one of the challenges we're facing is that public policy just hasn't caught up to that. You know, uh, as I mentioned, Paul Bradley uh, launched Rock USA from uh, his office at the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund in 2008, you know, and, you know, that's 14 years ago, and it seems like a long time, but in the world of public policy, uh, that's bar barely a blink of an eye. And so we're still waiting for public policy to catch up to this movement and uh, this source of uh, affordable housing. Um, and, and Joe, it's, actually, it's interesting to me to hear that some of the sort of more traditional banks are willing to lend to these. I know when we had done sort of earlier webinars, there's some limitations on who will lend to co-ops and, you know, maybe and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the difference is obviously there's there's real estate here and you can grant a, a mortgage to the bank and they feel a little bit more comfortable um, than they might, you know, lending into in, you know, more of an operational co-op, right? Perhaps that's the, the difference. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the other startup costs, um, are there programs available, resources available, grants for people who are looking at you know, may not be at the point of, you know, they need a loan to purchase the real estate, but they're in the development stage. Um, how are people sort of funding that process? Yeah, I'm wondering if Dora wanted to jump in and talk about pre-development funding and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think generally, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any uh, grants for sort of like that exploration period um, that are off the top of my head. I think that, the, again, this is a place where like as the affordability, the housing affordability crisis is like temperature turned up and up and up. I mean, I hope we see a rush of just policy catching up, grants catching up, uh, things to make this more feasible to explore so you don't need to rely on, you know, people who have the means to do this exploration being the only people that can take advantage of this model. Um, I know from the resident ownership, the manufactured housing side of the things, that's part of like our lending partnerships, the pre-development costs. Um, in states where there is a right of first refusal or an opportunity to purchase and in states where, you know, maybe you have a, a, a seller who is really interested or excited to sell it to their residents, which we'd love to talk more about. Um, Part of that is you, the residents need to know what they're buying, like you're saying, um, and we it's kind of the equivalent of like a housing inspection on steroids you're like you know and it costs money and it's forgivable costs as part of this model. Because it's not a right or it's not an opportunity or it's not you know you can't enter into that 
you can't finalize that, you know, purchase and sale agreement and buy unless you have a really, you know, thorough property conditions report, have a, a environmental site assessment. So our lending partners in this, you know, provide those pre-development funds. And if a resident group goes through this whole process, this whole exploration process and says, hey, this doesn't make sense for us, our infrastructure needs are, are way too great, or, you know, we don't like what we're seeing here for any number of reasons, um, those costs are forgivable. And that's how we make sure that people feel like they're not being rushed to make that decision about whether they want to buy. Um, if they do decide to buy, they become part of that, you know, total uh, financing package, that mortgage that they take out on there uh, for the property. Yeah, Craig, is that um, consistent with your experience or anything else you're aware of um, in terms of financing to add? That, that yeah, that is consistent. I, there's no nice, big, well-funded, how to you know start your own housing co-op fund um, that I've found so far. Uh, we on our website we share um, like a you know a folder that's folks can download for free and it's like a starter kit with template limited equity housing co-op bylaws and lease and subscription agreements. So you know some sample legal documents and. Uh, a little uh, pro forma that folks could use to play with numbers and see um, how affordable or unaffordable property acquisition um, could be for them. Um, and, uh, you know, other than some sort of uh, pre pre construction loan or you know, pre development loan of some kind, um, there's the, you know, the startup capital from the founding members. Uh, can be used to get things going. But in terms of outside sources, I think people can be persuaded to contribute capital or to donate money to uh, to new housing co-ops, but there's not a formal system for that, unfortunately. And in general, especially in Maine, we don't see um, a lot in terms of like public funding that's, that's programmed specifically to help housing co-ops like we do. And maybe some other states are especially in Canada, where it's more formally part of their public housing program. And I'd also lift up, like looking in the Q and A, people answering questions and asking them, and then answering them for themselves, which is cool. I mean, uh, someone's jumping in from the Genesis Fund, talking about that they make pre-development loans to CDI for rocks, and as well, uh, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board does uh, forgivable pre-development to explore that that sort of leg of, of the process here. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe we can provide um, from, from Erica Connect and provide some information and when we send the follow up around so people can have the link to that as well. Sounds like that would be helpful. Um, Turing, there's a few other questions coming in. So let me I'll open up for the group. One question is, how do you determine the, the share price that members are going to pay? I don't know if that's maybe the best question for you, Craig, or from uh, for CDI to answer. Uh, I'm happy to answer it. Um, so the share price, the, the co-op chooses uh, what the par value of the share is going to be uh, when they start the co-op. And I think, it, you know, they can really choose anything. I think it's it's sort of based on how much capital do you need to raise from your members to get started. Um, so, you know, you can the quickest way to figure that out is to work back from like, what is your total development cost? How much are you going to get, get from other sources? Um, like, you know, how much are you going to borrow uh, or have donated or granted to you? And then how much uh, capital is, uh, is left to raise? And uh, how many members do you have to raise it from? And so that math is sort of going to get you to what your starting share price is going to be. And then it's going to increase based upon whatever your equity formula is, whether it's market rate or limited equity, or if it's group equity, then the share price will not change from that point. Uh, um, nor or Joe, anything to add? Um, I think Bob knows this. He's a leader in his rock, but it's it's typically set at a uh, hundred dollars in a resident-owned community. It can't exceed generally. Um, $1,000, um, but most groups set it at $100 um, with a $5 buy-in, and then you get the $100 back when you move out. Uh, another question um, 
is whether you're familiar with any housing co-op that's purchased a, a section eight or I, I think it'd be any building with existing residents who didn't want to be part of the cooperative or, or couldn't be part of the cooperative and how is that handled? I guess it's sort of a, I don't know, force, I'm imagining you can't force people to be participate in the co-op and that would be a problem, but I'm curious if that's been an issue before in any of your developments. I think, I don't you know. You go first this time? You go first. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, we have, um, our biggest building is, uh, that we operate is nine units. When we purchased it, six of the six of the nine units were occupied. Uh, we and it, uh, and some residents did have Section Eight or, or some sort of rental assistance. It was not a project-based, uh, you know, subsidized building, um, but some individual residents had had mobile vouchers. Uh, we invited all the residents to um, stay and apply for membership in the in the housing co-op. And all the resident, all of the households did stay. Five of the six households uh, wanted to become co-op members and did. And then one household uh, did not want to join, but wanted to continue living in the building. So we allowed them to remain as uh, tenants. And in a in a rock, I'd I'd add that uh, definitely at the point of conversion, we we always. Uh, see some households who are like, you know what, I don't want to be part of this co-op. I'm perfectly happy, you know, not participating it always happens. Um, and anyone who's in the community, there's no displacement. So anyone who's already a household in place um, is, you know, they stay in the community, they are, you know, afforded all the rights of being a tenant in a manufactured housing community, and they're welcome at any point to join. Um, and we often see people, you know, maybe at first they they were like, what's going on? A year down the line, two years, they're like, well, now we have community bingo, or now everything's actually, the trees are actually being taken care of, or, you know, the road's getting done. So we often see groups trickle in and be left with very, very few uh, non-member households. Makes sense. Um, <clears throat> some more questions coming in here that we can we can get to um, and being answered, but just sort of one question, because I think it's come up in some of the, the prep calls um, that we had for this, um, but, you know, obviously we, we talked a little about affordable housing and the need for affordable housing, um, particularly, you know, focusing on in Maine, but it's not unique to Maine. But um, what what do you guys see as some of the the biggest challenges out there and, and what, you know, if you could sort of have a wish list of changes to be made um, to facilitate these types of developments? Is it, um, you know, municipality issues? Is it sort of state legislative changes? Um, what do you see as sort of the next steps to really open up um, expanding these type of cooperative developments? Maybe I'll get the ball rolling and then I know we probably all have very long wish lists. <laughs> Bob has a, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just top of the wish list coming to mind um, for the, for the co-op manufactured housing sector, but it's true in multi and single family as well. It's, it, you know, we're seeing this, really intense, uh, pernicious rush of, you know, investment companies into the sector. And it is turning up the heat on everything, on sale prices, on the pace of sales. Um, it's scary. And so, you know, we're having generations of local families that own communities just get these wild offers from these large, large companies that are based on the other side of the country. Um, and it means that the sale prices are higher. And once you We've seen that once a community gets bought by an investment company uh, or a you know a real estate investment trust, it's really hard to get it back into local resident control. So we hear residents express like you know now we're like a a freaking revolving door for these companies, and it feels really powerless. So part of it is just sort of our wish list is like really uh, in addition to policy, which I think Joe will be able to talk more about, is really getting the word out that this is an option. Um, in Maine, you know, we have 10 resident owned communities, but there's like, you know, in the 400, uh, 483, I believe, manufactured housing communities, I could be a little bit off on that number. So we're really just trying to get the word out is our wish list, <laughs> like letting brokers know, letting realtors know, letting sellers, owners know that, you know, this is an option that we have uh, supported resident groups through a process that is dates back 40 years and yields results that are like sustainable and successful and keep it local and keep it resident controlled. So that's sort of one of the things we wanna get the words out. Um, 
I also think that even, even with 303 across the country and a lot of housing co-ops um, in other sectors, you're still operating in a system where the dominant thing is privately owned. Uh, so, you know, I think most accountants, attorneys, uh, lenders, uh, brokers are just sort of predisposed to understand how privately owned real estate works. And it's kind of a learning curve, I, you know, to be like, okay, this is a co-op, like we need to get our books done. Maybe the accountant's never seen a cooperative bookkeeping uh, or maybe the property manager is not familiar with a co-op. So it is residents of co-ops are not only you know, functioning as a democracy with their neighbors, which is, you know, fun and challenging, but they're also doing community-wide education, which is really effective, you see, but also takes time to say, okay, this is how we work. Let's get the property manager on board. Let's get the accountant, the attorney on board. So I think being able to like build that ecosystem we're always going to talk about so that the burden is less on an individual co-op and it's more, you know, shared across many, many, many co-ops would be our wish list too. What am I missing, Joe? How, how much else on my wish list do we want to talk about? No, I, I think that's really good, Nora. I, you know, one of the thoughts that occurred to me is that uh, we're seeing a doubling of investor activity in the manufactured housing community sector. You know, it's the big players, you know, it's Blackstone Group, Apollo Global Management, Carlisle Group, Stockbridge Capital. They've invested billions of dollars to buy up manufactured housing communities. And in places like uh, Maine, where there isn't a, a resident right to uh, uh, purchase the community, uh, we're seeing a lot of portfolio sales and and it just you can't disentangle uh, and deconsolidate those portfolio sales to give residents a reasonable opportunity to make an offer for their community so one owner may be selling three or four communities and wants to sell them as a bundle and uh, you can't pull one of those communities out of the portfolio to make a purchase if the residents really are interested and then I, I won't take up too much more time because I want to hear from Craig and, and see some of the similarities. But uh, two other, you know, you know, serious issues that we're seeing in this sector are, uh, you know, the infrastructure that Nora already talked about. There's been an underinvestment in these communities for decades. You know, there's a understandable tension between investment in uh, infrastructure in a privately owned community and profit motive. And, uh, you know, can all understand that. And so uh, in those communities, when we see them convert, they're usually inheriting, uh, you know, really subpar uh, infrastructure, life supporting systems within their community. And part of this system that we're using, part of this model, really, as Nora said, we, we do engineering studies and, and we want the residents to have, you know, a high quality of life in their communities. And so we want to address those issues as soon as possible, uh, right after the purchase. Um, and then lastly, you know, the uh, it's the homes themselves. Uh, in Maine, these manufactured homes are, are considered a chattel property, you know, movable property like cars. And it makes interest rates four to 500 basis points, you know, 4%, 5% higher for people to purchase. Uh, which is a double whammy for them because it hurts them at time of purchase with higher interest rates. And then it also hurts them when they go to sell their, their home because, you know, the total housing cost is impacted by that higher interest rate and they can't always get full value of what the home is actually worth. So, you know, those I think in a nutshell are, are the three big issues we're, we're seeing. So to add to that, I mean, there's a lot to say about the, the complexity of the housing crisis um, and wh where co-ops fit into that. I'll start by saying just broadly, I think a huge thing that could help housing co-ops, especially for low income people, um, but, but you know, uh, people nationwide is to fully fund um, Section 8 rental assistance program uh, or, or where it is, uh, where it falls short to have state programs to, to supplement, but ideally it's just fully funded. So um, today, only a quarter of the people eligible for uh, rental assistance for the Section 8 um, you know, housing assistance program actually receive, receive the benefit. Um, and it's simply because it's not fully funded. And if, 
from a co-ops perspective that's trying to serve low income folks who don't have much money. And Section 8 is completely compatible with uh, you know, a housing cooperative. Um, if the residents actually have the income to afford uh, a decent unit, that's a, that's a good starting point for developing your, your business plan. Um, but if you're trying to serve low income tenants with a housing co-op and they don't have the, the money to pay for uh, a habitable unit, even though they're eligible um, for these assistance programs, but they don't get the assistance because they're not properly funded, uh, that's a problem. Um, and so I think that's like the, the quickest, simplest way to help uh, the people that are struggling most in our housing crisis would be to have that fully funded. Um, but then additionally, uh, in the interest of housing co-ops, I think uh, all, you know, all the programs that we have for housing should be figuring out, you know, should have specific policy that speaks to housing co-ops. Ideally, it even you know, favors co -op, housing co-ops in terms of uh, incentives and interest rates and uh, the, the, maybe the fees that developers can earn. Um, but at a minimum, it at least understands them because most housing co-ops are starting at least in Maine, my experience is uh, from somewhat a, of a disadvantaged standpoint because a lot of the partners in the project have a steep learning curve to understand what a housing co-op is and how risky is it. Um, and they're just, there's a lot more information that needs to be covered before you can actually get to the development part. Um, so I think I think Maine is catching up uh, in, in terms of that, but it's, it's definitely not there yet. Um, and then lastly, you know, CDI has been doing a lot of this sort of technical development support for the resident owned communities that hasn't been done much um, on the multi unit side, except for, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have anyone from Maine Cooperative Development Partners represented in the, on the panel today. Um, but there's been a lot of exciting stuff happening in Portland around multi unit housing cooperative development. Um, and those projects are not completed yet, but I think there's some good stuff in the works and in the next, you know, five years or so, I think, you know, Portland will probably be where uh, most of the cooperatively owned housing, multi-unit urban, uh, multi-unit cooperative housing is in the state. Um, and so I think they're, they're starting to figure out how a development model could happen, but it's, you know, it's a big lift for residents that are just want to have like a decent place to live to form their own corporation and uh, figure out how to figure out how to run it properly just so they can have good housing. Um, and uh, if someone were, and, and for developers right now, the, there's not a huge, other than just an interest and a sympathy for the issue, I don't think there's a huge economic incentive to be helping uh, residents develop housing cooperatives as opposed to um, just standard rental housing um, or, or you know, market rate housing. Um, so uh, figuring out, you know, having something like that get developed uh, and ideally having economic incentives uh, attached to these programs that really like lead folks in that direction um, could really make a difference. And we're starting to see the beginnings of that. I think. Thanks, Trey. A couple more questions coming in. Maybe we can try and try and get to them. So let me open it up again to everyone. Um, question is, how willing um, or does a developer inspire resident owners to serve as leaders of the co-op? Can we get this one kicked off, Greg? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, resident leadership is essential uh, in my mind to, to, to being a true cooperative. Uh, I mean, our our residents elect our board of directors, our residents are our board of directors, and uh, a, a big important component for staff is to be developing the leadership capacity of our residents, to understand the issues, to uh, be, understand their options, to be making informed decisions, to be you know, representing the co-op, participating in public education events. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, empowerment of the residents and their leadership in the organization, I think is really important to invest in if you're gonna have a successful uh, co cooperative. Yeah, I'd totally echo that. I think that as a, as in the co-op developer uh, side of things, uh, which I, I think maybe there's a lot on the, on the call today, 
it's like I it's a lot of like subverting the idea of expertise like when I go work with a group it's like it's easy to like come in with this dynamic of expert but then it's like oh no 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 pump the brakes <laughs> like that is not what's at play here like uh or the resident and resident leaders are the experts full stop in the room um I'm gonna just you know put uh, Bob who asked a question earlier kind of in the spotlight for a second who's on the call you know he's he drove the process with his board and his resident in his manufactured housing community through a conversion all this year leading a you know policy push with the town with the state and you know a community push organizing his neighbors spending hours with all of his neighbors um ranging a huge range of ages kind of making them understand what was going on what they were facing as their community was up for sale so without that you know was not they were not going to become resident owned um so it's kind of not a negotiable um, in terms of cooperatives. You know, it looks like we have about a minute or so left. So I don't know if maybe Craig, you want to turn back to the last slide. I think we've covered all, maybe all of it or almost all of it, but any final thoughts um, before we wrap up here? No, yeah, I think we did cover most of what's here. I, uh, maybe the one thing we didn't mention as far as the history goes, um, you know, the other type of housing co-op that's out there in Maine is um, these uh, senior living facilities that are campuses usually rural, located rurally or in, in suburban areas uh, along the coast. And I think they kind of were the kickoff to the statute, to the Cooperative Affordable Housing Corporation statute in the early 90s in Maine. Um, and they're uh, combining the co housing cooperative incorporation status with condominiums and with rental and a number of other things. Um, I've had less, I haven't seen them very involved in like the cooperative movement, um, uh, you know, at, at the Cooperative Main Business Alliance and things like that. So I haven't really had much exposure to them to learn about what cooperative housing means to them. But I do think that, that the legal statute that we have uh, in, is in part owed to some work that they did in the early 90s. And uh, Joe or and or Nora, Nora, anything else to add before we wrap up? I, I want to thank you, Adam, and uh, the staff at Bernstein Insure for making this so uh, easy to participate in. And Craig, I always enjoy any time I get to spend with you. You're so full of knowledge about this sector and just really appreciate how willing you are to share it. Uh, yeah, you're a state treasurer in Maine. Um, yeah, as complex as we've made this sound today, I, I do want to leave with 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 this uh, for brokers and owners who are out there and residents and other communities who are listening in or might listen to this in the future. We are here to guide you. CDI can guide you through this process. You know, we get appointed as the designated uh, representative for the community uh, housing homeowners association. So for an owner. It, this is a seamless process for the owners and the brokers. They work with our professional staff to uh, go through the sales process. We don't play any games. Uh, we can get to the closing table in 120 days or fewer. Uh, no commissions or fees on our part uh, to the owner. Um, we've guided you know, nearly 60 of these closings in the past 10 years. And we have access to social enterprise lending uh, that will provide a you know, 100% loan to value. So we can make this happen uh, in almost any circumstance if the residents are willing to, you know, put the work in and work with us to make it happen. So just want to leave with that, uh, that this is, you know, it's a complex issue, uh, but CDI exists to, uh, as Craig was saying earlier, to provide the technical assistance on the resident side and make it seamless for the owners and brokers on the purchase side. Nor anything you would like to add? You said it perfect. Um, thank you, everyone. Great. Th thank you, Joe, um, Craig, and Nora uh, for participating. I know everyone's has a lot going on, um, and we really, really appreciate your your participation and support. Um, for those in attendance, we'll send around the link to the recording, um, including the Spanish translation as well as some other resources. Um, you also get the contact information for myself and our, our panelists. So don't hesitate to reach out if there's any questions we didn't get to. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity, hopefully you'll be able to watch 
uh, one of the other recordings for our other webinars, which are also on the Bernstein Shirt website. So thanks a lot, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon.